My wife, Saya, had an affair with my stepfather, Andrew, all because she was after his money and thought she could secure a million dollar mansion for herself. What she didn't realize is that the mansion she was chasing after actually belongs to me. Now I find myself in an enormous mess that fills me with shame and embarrassment. It's the kind of humiliation that pierces right to the core, making it hard to even talk about my situation out loud. My wife, who I've been married to for seven years, is betraying me with my mother's husband. Yes, that's right, my wife is cheating with Andrew, the man who became my stepfather after my mom married him. I'm 38 years old, married to Saya, who's also 38, and our relationship has been pretty normal for the most part. Like any couple, we've had our fair share of ups and downs. The downs mostly came from Saya feeling like I was too close to my mom. She would tease me, calling me a mama's boy. I won't try to defend that label too much because my mom isn't around anymore, she passed away two years ago. I take comfort in knowing that I loved her the way she deserved. My mom did everything she could for me, raising me as a single parent and giving me the best life possible, even when times were tough. My mom was on her own for nearly two decades until she met Andrew ten years ago. I can't quite understand what my mom saw in him, but she went ahead and married him even though they had only known each other for a short time. Before my mom passed, I hardly knew Andrew. When I visited my mom, it felt like he was just a stranger in the house. Our interactions were limited to casual greetings and polite smiles. I never really accepted him as a father figure, but I always made sure to hide those feelings from my mom. I was relieved that she found companionship in her later years, even though I didn't feel close to Andrew. After my mom's passing, Andrew was out of sight and out of mind for me. I didn't even see him at her funeral, he was still living in my mom's house, but I had no desire to connect with him. Then one day, I spotted something that changed everything. I was driving home when I saw Sayo and Andrew sitting together at a roadside cafe. Andrew had his arms wrapped around her, and it didn't look like a friendly gesture. Their body language felt off to me, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to their connection. I was supposed to meet an old friend that day, but I couldn't focus on anything he was saying. I kept thinking about what I'd just seen and how out of place it was, considering our family dynamics. Sayo and Andrew were never close, so witnessing this kind of intimacy between them made me uncomfortable. After my meeting, I went home and confronted Sayo. When I told her I saw her with Andrew, her face went pale, and she struggled to find words. Eventually, she admitted they had lunch together after running into each other. She tried to explain that Andrew was really upset about losing my mom and that she was just trying to comfort him. She said he was a lonely old man who needed someone to talk to which was why he held her hands. But I knew what I saw. I didn't tell her that I saw him holding her hands, I saw him with his arms around her, and the way they were talking made it clear this was more than just mourning. They looked comfortable with each other in a way that felt flirtatious. I didn't express my doubts, but I didn't buy her excuse for a second. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I decided to investigate further before confronting her again. Saya works as a nail artist at a beauty salon, and her work schedule usually kept her busy on weekends while she had weekdays off. It had never been an issue between us until recently when she started working more and more, leaving less time for our relationship. Our arguments about this became frequent, with Saya saying I was being needy. After my mom's death, she thought I should be okay with her absence since I used to visit my mom regularly. She was wrong. I always made the effort to balance my visits, ensuring I spent time with Saya on her days off. This balance seemed to slip away. I always made sure to get home on time so I could spend some quality time with her. In the past, she would argue that I was just a mama's boy, but now her take had changed. She claimed I was needy. While all this was happening, I caught glimpses of her with my stepdad, which only fueled my anger. A few weeks later came Thanksgiving, the last one we just had. She insisted that we invite Andrew. Her suggestion caught me off guard. She explained that Andrew was alone and had no family to spend the day with, so it was only right for us to include him as part of the extended family. I couldn't help but remind her that she never invited Andrew or anyone from that side when my mom was still alive. She replied that back then, they had each other to rely on, but now Andrew was by himself. Eventually, I gave in to her request, not just to keep the peace but also out of curiosity. I wanted to see how they interacted in front of me. I won't say their behavior was normal, especially with everything I now knew, but they managed to keep the conversation light enough that nothing seemed suspicious at first glance. I mostly stayed quiet throughout the dinner, feeling an overwhelming sense of discomfort. I had never liked him, and my suspicions about his motives only made his presence all the more unbearable. It felt as though he sensed my distaste, which only added to the awkwardness of the evening. 
As we sat at the table, Celia attempted to fill the silence with some trivial topics, but neither of us was genuinely engaged, merely tossing out fake smiles in response. It became increasingly tough for me to carry the weight of my feelings, so I started devising a plan to uncover the truth. I initially thought about checking her phone, but it was locked, and I didn't want to raise any alarms by asking her for the password. So, I decided to take a different approach. I told Celia I had to go out of town for work for a couple of days. On the day I claimed to leave, I actually got up early and went to my office as usual. But first, I had planted a GPS tracker in Celia's car to monitor her movements. Around mid-afternoon, I noticed she drove over to Andrew's place. My plan was to catch her in the act, but a nagging worry crossed my mind, what if I showed up and they were just having a casual chat? I didn't want to embarrass myself. So, I reached out to my friend Keith for support. I explained my suspicions and asked if he could swing by Andrew's house. I figured it was a smart plan, if he spotted anything inappropriate, he could record it. The house was password protected, and I hoped Andrew hadn't changed it recently. Keith was understandably hesitant, he thought Andrew might catch on to his snooping. I suggested he could simply say the front door was open and he was just checking in on him. Since the main door didn't lead directly into the living area, there was less chance of raising any suspicions as he made his way inside. After convincing him, he agreed to go. Once he got there, he couldn't find anyone in the hallway, so he decided to peek into the bedroom, discreetly recording with his phone hidden in his shirt pocket. What he saw was shocking, Andrew and Celia were wrapped up together, completely naked. Overwhelmed, Keith exclaimed, sorry, and hurriedly left the house before they noticed. Unfortunately, Andrew spotted him and came out, asking what he was doing. Keith quickly replied that he was just checking in and would come back later. Then, he rushed to his car, eager to avoid any confrontation with either of them. I couldn't believe how stupid Keith was, instead of using the back camera to record, he had the front camera on the whole time, capturing nothing but their shocked faces rather than the evidence I needed. Even so, I got the confirmation I was looking for. Before I left the house that day, I had already packed a bag with two changes of clothes and my toiletries. I went to Keith's place since his wife was away visiting her parents, and he insisted I stay with him until everything settled down. Celia, knowing that Keith could spill the truth, texted me, asking when I'd be coming home. I chose not to respond. I ghosted her. Her messages and calls flooded my phone, but she had no idea I was ignoring her on purpose. She believes that I'm away on a work trip, but the truth is that everything changed four days ago. I've already reached out to a lawyer online because I can't stand the thought of seeing her face ever again. My plan is to serve her with divorce papers and make sure she gets kicked out of my house. As for an update, it took my lawyer ten whole days to get the divorce papers ready. She wasn't in a hurry to sign them and wanted to have a talk instead. My lawyer suggested we try to settle things outside of court because that could save us a lot of time and money. Being in sales means I have a regular job with limited funds to spend on legal stuff, and I also don't have many vacation days to spare for court appearances. So, I agreed to meet with her, but with my lawyer present as a safeguard. When I got to the meeting, she pushed for a private conversation. I felt uneasy about it, but my lawyer told me it was okay to talk, but I should stick to his rules and avoid making any promises. He set some boundaries for our discussion, no touching, no hugs, and definitely no confessions. Just being in the same room as her made me feel sick. She tried to hug me, but I pushed her away and told her that I wasn't interested in her excuses. She claimed it was all a misunderstanding, and after reading countless cheating stories on Reddit, I knew all the usual lines cheaters use. I couldn't help but think about how she was trying to convince me that she was just looking out for a lonely old man. She admitted that what Keith saw was accurate and that she wasn't denying anything, but insisted it was just cuddling, nothing more. Yeah, sure, cuddling without clothes counts as nothing. Then she said something that completely shocked me, she claimed she did it to protect our future. I didn't understand how that made sense. Her reasoning was that since my mom left all her wealth to Andrew, if he married someone else, that person would then have a claim to that wealth. She went on to say that our family's property could end up with someone else. I couldn't hold back, I told her that was the reason she was messing around with my stepdad, so she could become my stepmother and grab my mother's inheritance. The twisted family dynamics were overwhelming, and I felt like I might pass out from the nonsense, so I left the meeting room in a fit of anger. Once I returned to my lawyer's office, I had to recount everything that happened. He found it amusing, but was also curious about the inheritance situation. My mother left behind a mansion she inherited from her uncle, a sprawling property way beyond what I could afford. Celia had always had her eye on that mansion, especially after we got married. She often insisted that we should move into that house. At first, 
I thought it was great that she wanted to be with my mom, but what she really wanted was for my mother to move out of her own home and for us to take over the mansion. I flat out refused. I couldn't understand why my mom should leave her own house. Celia argued that since I'm her only son, the house would eventually belong to me, so why not just move in? This led to constant fighting between us. Eventually, I resorted to lying and told her that my mom had willed the house to Andrew. I had no idea how much that lie would cost me. Celia went after my stepdad, hoping it would help her get the mansion. There was one thing Celia didn't know, after my mom passed away, I didn't transfer the ownership of the house into my name. I wanted Andrew to have the option to live there as long as he wanted, and I figured transferring it to my name would create complications. Plus, I was short on cash back then, so I let it go. Thankfully, I didn't transfer it because if I had, Celia would rightfully have claimed half of it during the divorce, or maybe she wouldn't have cheated if that had been the case, but who knows. Cheaters are cheaters, no matter what. My mom had indeed willed that house to me, but Celia was completely unaware. She tried to persuade me to reconsider the divorce, claiming she would soon charm Andrew into giving her that mansion. I found her proposal laughable and told her no thanks, she could keep her mansion. She smirked and said I was losing a lot by leaving her. I just smiled back and said I didn't care at all. I didn't know what else to say at that point. I wasn't sure if she was genuinely that clueless all the time or if she was just pretending to be dumb in order to protect herself from feeling embarrassed, but honestly, it didn't matter to me. Celia was well aware that I didn't have much money to my name, except for the savings we had put together in our joint account which was now divided between us after the divorce. I felt an immense sense of relief now that everything was finalized. If Celia had discovered the truth about who really owned the mansion, I knew she would have never chosen to leave me. I had no intention of sharing my mom's inheritance with someone like her. Celia had sealed her own fate when she let slip her true intentions about dating Andrew. I had planned to use that against her to make Andrew back off. I watched them from a distance, with Andrew picking her up from the courthouse and helping her through all the legal stuff during our divorce. I was just waiting for the papers to be signed so I could pop her little bubble and see how she reacted. Now that the divorce was over, my next move was to ruin my ex's happiness. Once the divorce was officially done, I sent a message to Andrew detailing Celia's confession. He was surprised to learn that my mom had willed the mansion to me. I simply replied that I had the will, but Celia was going to try and convince him to give it to her. I wasn't helping Andrew out by sharing this information, but my goal was to throw Celia off balance. She was dreaming about inheriting my mom's mansion, and I couldn't wait to watch her face when she realized it wasn't happening. Andrew mentioned that lately, Celia had been subtly asking him about his will and who would inherit his money. He didn't pick up on her intentions since he didn't have any wealth himself. I made sure not to have any loyalty to him, so I left the conversation hanging there. Then, I received a call from Celia. Normally, I wouldn't have answered, but I knew she would be furious about the mansion. When I picked up, she was yelling about why I hadn't told her that my mother had left the house to me. She felt betrayed after helping me through the divorce, thinking she was doing me a favor. I found it amusing, actually, listening to her rant. I just thanked her for her concern and wished her luck with her attempts to keep the mansion. After that, I hung up and blocked her number. A few days later, she called from an unknown number, possibly borrowed from a friend. She told me that Andrew had dumped her once he found out she was only with him for the money. He had called her a greedy person, and she was now trying to convince him that she was just looking out for him. It was almost comical to hear her desperately trying to play the victim when her true colors were so obvious. I couldn't help but respond sarcastically, pointing out how selfless she claimed to be. She insisted that her connection with Andrew was all for my benefit so I could get the mansion, and then switched her story to say she was helping him deal with his loneliness. Really, what a, pure soul, she was turning out to be. But Celia didn't stop there. She went to great lengths to reach me, trying to get back together, sometimes even gaslighting me. She showed up at my house, my workplace, and various public spots where I usually hung out. It was beyond ridiculous. One time, I was at the gym, and she cornered me, but I acted like she was just someone I didn't know. Technically, that's what she was now, our divorce was finalized, and we were no longer connected. Just when I thought this whole mess was behind me, my past came back to haunt me right after I transferred the mansion into my name. I genuinely couldn't understand what her obsession was with the house. I mean, who wouldn't want a mansion worth millions? But it made me wonder how long it would take her to accept the truth. Six months after the divorce, I decided it was time to officially take ownership of the mansion, even though I had waited this long because my savings weren't enough until then. I found myself in a situation where I simply didn't have enough money saved up to handle the ownership transfer of the house. 
This was particularly challenging after my divorce, but with my expenses dropping significantly, I managed to save the amount needed for the transfer within just four to five months. Before applying for the transfer, I made sure to inform Andrew about my plans. He wasn't living in that house anymore following the revelation of his affair with Saya. Even though I could have asked him to vacate the property, I chose not to. Instead, Andrew mentioned that he would collect his remaining belongings, which he did without any issues. He also made me the administrator of the locking system for the house, which meant I had control over access. The whole process took a couple of months for all the paperwork to be finalized, during which time I took the initiative to freshen up the place. The house needed a new coat of paint, and I noticed that the lawn and the pool had been neglected for quite some time. I arranged for everything to be cleaned up, making the house more presentable and livable. During this period, I had not been in touch with Saya, but the last update I received was concerning her breakup with Andrew. This made it all the more surprising when she unexpectedly showed up at the mansion while the cleaning crew was working. I was out at the time, and the cleaning manager called to inform me that a woman had entered the house. They attempted to stop her, but she insisted she was my wife. This claim raised suspicions, especially since she was touching the walls and exploring the interiors in a way that made them think she might be trespassing. I promptly told them to remove her from the property, clarifying that I had no wife. They followed my instructions and later called to confirm that she had been escorted out. It wasn't long before Saya showed up again at my house, this time in a distressed state. She was crying and claiming that I had abandoned her, insisting she had done nothing wrong and that her intentions were honest. I told her that she really needed to seek help, suggesting she go to a mental hospital rather than trying to enter my home. She wanted to talk, but I firmly shut the door on her. To ensure my peace of mind, I also took out a restraining order against Saya concerning my property. Although she hadn't shown any signs of violence, I didn't want to take any chances with the new tenants who would eventually move in. I wanted to protect their interests and keep Saya from causing any unnecessary trouble. So far, everything has been going smoothly, and I hope that no further incidents occur regarding her. I want that chapter of my life to close so I can finally move on. Now, shifting to another story, I had an unexpected and rather awkward encounter after hooking up with a girl I met on Tinder. As a typical university student, I was simply trying to survive finals week. After a particularly stressful day filled with exams and studying for my ancient literature class, I decided to take a moment to scroll through Tinder. It had been a while since I had used the app, and I thought it might help me unwind. Little did I know that this would lead to more stress than I ever anticipated. I matched with a girl who was just a mile away. She was 25, a bit older than me, and incredibly attractive. She seemed really interested, so I decided to take the plunge. She invited me over to her apartment but mentioned that she needed to leave in about 20 minutes, so we had to hurry. Things escalated quickly, and just about three minutes into what was happening, we heard the front door open. Alarmed, she told me to stop, so I did. We both listened closely as footsteps approached, and I could feel a wave of panic wash over me, reminiscent of the embarrassment I felt when my parents caught me with my ex a few years back. However, nothing could have prepared me for what happened next. The door swung open, and in walked none other than my ancient literature professor, the very same one I had been cramming for just moments before. He paused, taken aback, and the sheer shock on his face mirrored my own. He froze when he saw her and gasped, and then his eyes turned to me. In an instant, his face flushed a deep shade of red, and he shouted at me to get out of his house. I could feel the volume of his voice ringing in my ears, and I'm pretty sure I lost a bit of my hearing from how loud he yelled. I quickly threw on my shorts, feeling a rush of panic, and dashed back to my quad. Now, as I lie in bed, I can't shake the thought that my college professor just saw me completely naked. Not only that, but I was caught in the act with his daughter, which is even more embarrassing. He already didn't think much of me, and I know he's a tough grader. I'm bracing myself for the worst when it comes to my finals, I can just tell that I'm going to completely bomb it and it's going to mess up my GPA. I have to face him tomorrow at 11am wish me luck, and I'll keep you posted on what happens. Short update, I've taken the exam, but there's still a cloud of uncertainty hanging over me. I need to keep the personal details under wraps because this situation has spiraled beyond what I ever expected, and I want to avoid turning it into a campus-wide scandal. When I shuffled into class, I was praying that my life wouldn't be destroyed by my professor. Thankfully, the TA walked in and announced that, due to a family emergency, my professor wouldn't be there to proctor today's exam. She assured us that he would email back our graded exams by the end of Saturday. Right after she said this, she started handing out the tests. When she got to me, she gave me a knowing look and laughed, which felt like a slap in the face. I thought to myself, great, now the administration probably knows what's going on. 
Anyway, I took the test, and surprisingly, I felt pretty good about how I did. As soon as I stepped out of the classroom, I checked my email, which has become a habit of mine. I noticed that my professor had emailed me. The email read, please meet my wife, myself, and the Dean of Academic Affairs in room number in the building tomorrow at 1 p.m. There we will discuss our situation and how to proceed. Thank you in advance for your understanding and cooperation. Best, professor name. Now, I'm left feeling confused and anxious. First of all, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm baffled as to why his wife is involved, but I know there's verbal and written consent, and I could show our Tinder DMs if it comes down to it. Plus, his daughter has an IUD, so I'm pretty sure this isn't going to lead to any unwanted surprises. My biggest concern at this point is how this whole situation will affect my relationships with my professors and the administration. I guess I'll update again tomorrow after the meeting. Edit, after reading some comments, the possibility that the woman in the meeting could be his wife makes more sense. She never mentioned her relationship with him, but I really hope that's not the case. I'm just scared that I might have terrified him at the thought of having me as a future son-in-law. Update 1, since many of you wanted to hear how this turns out, here's the latest. In just a few hours, my worries went from possibly being sued to maybe becoming a school legend. Unfortunately, a few of my friends found my Reddit post, and thanks to the class name and my professor being absent, they pieced together exactly what happened. Shortly after I posted, I received an email notifying me that the meeting had been rescheduled. Everyone involved was set to meet a little later in a soundproof room because they wanted to keep this private. We met around 2.30pm, and my professor and the Dean of Academic Affairs took their seats across from me. As many of you predicted, the person who walked in with a ring on her finger was actually the daughter I had hooked up with. Thankfully, neither she nor the professor accused me of assault or anything like that. Surprisingly, the meeting was pretty straightforward. Two other professors would grade the exams instead of my professor to ensure everything was fair. According to the student handbook, if a professor has a problem with a student, they have to submit all previous exam materials to the administration for review. The scheduling office will move me to a different professor's class next semester. I feel relieved that the meeting went as well as possible, but my situation is still a bit shaky. I tried to handle everything as best as I could, but honestly, my situation is far from where I want it to be. The thing is, my friends came across some posts I shared, and now they've spilled the beans to a big chunk of our friend group. It's not just a small circle that knows, it's a lot of people. So now, instead of things being casual and low-key, everyone is talking about my Tinder hookups. It's like the whole vibe has shifted, and what was supposed to be just some fun has turned into a big deal, making it super awkward to hang out. It's tough because I didn't mean for it to get out like this, and now I feel like I'm under a microscope with my friends. What was once just a part of my life I thought I could keep private has become a topic of conversation, which is not what I wanted at all.